I woke up to some bad news. Reverb is raising their fees. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Yeah, that's right, Reverb's raising their fees. They're going from 3.5% all the way up to 5%, so a 1.5% increase. So to put that into perspective, if you're selling a $2,000 guitar, you will now be paying an additional $30 in fees on that for a total of $100 when it used to be 70. So let's talk about this. I know what you're all thinking. Cut to the montage of flipping tables over, saying I'll never use reverb again. What a joke. We all knew this was gonna happen, I think, that the fees would be raised. Because it was just about a year ago, on July 22nd of 2019, when Etsy bought out reverb. And if you go to reverb today, click on the listing, and take a look at it as compared to what reverb looked like a year ago, so much has changed. And some of the stuff was kind of hard to get used to, like seeing when it was listed being down here in the product specs. But for the most part, these changes, I've adapted to them now. I like most of them. I think they've made it easier to see everything all on one screen. I've noticed that the lag from switching photo to photo is pretty much non-existent anymore. They've really dialed in the site over the past year. But if we go to Etsy and click on one of their listings here, you're gonna see, huh? That looks pretty familiar. <laughs> so now the big question, why? Why are they raising fees? Let's just read through this letter just in case you didn't get it. It was titled, Growing Together, an important update from Reverb. Yeah, they always send emails like this, so I'm sure a lot of people will miss this. So they said they're writing to share that upcoming changes that will significantly grow their marketplace so you can reach even more buyers around the world. So this is beginning on August 4th, 2020. So we've got about two weeks to bulk list all our items and hopefully sell them before the price increase. So then it continues to say that this was launched in 2013 and I remember when Reverb was in its infancy stage. Like I didn't think it was actually going to be a competitor to eBay. But kind of like what they talked about here, a live support team staffed by musicians and just an all around better platform than eBay and a whole boatload of marketing, they were able to overthrow eBay to the point where eBay viewed them as such a competitor that they had to match their fee. This is eBay's fee table right here. Everything used to be 10% with a maximum of $750. So even if you're upset about this new 5%, just remember that is half of what we used to have to pay to eBay because they got them to match the 3.5% and the 350 maximum. But this is also a turning point. eBay is either going to in turn match that to 5% or they're gonna steal a whole boatload of business away from Reverb and keep it at 3.5%. I'll be interested to see how that plays out. Because even though eBay's platform, it's not as good, they still have a good search feature and a lot of people still list guitars on here. But the one bad thing about eBay is they allow these Japanese brokers to list guitars that they don't actually own. I mean, if you order it, you will get it if it's still in stock. You can check out this video to learn more about that. This isn't even one of the worst ones with 215 listings. I mean, sometimes they'll have like thousands of them, but it's still definitely a viable way to sell stuff. I, I just really don't like their message feature. It's hard to send stuff. Reverb definitely has a better platform and they know it. So even if eBay doesn't match the price, I can still see people using Reverb over eBay. But continuing on here, they say as more buyers move online, I think that's code name for some like COVID related things. Like they have to redo their workspace to make sure people are six feet apart. I mean, it's more expensive now to have people within your company, more so than just paying them a living wage. So I think that has something to do with this price increase as well. But they're saying they've heard us loud and clear. We want more support and tools to help get your gear in front of Reverb's expanding audience. They want to invest more in uh, SEO searches, online video advertising. I'm not sure I understand what that means because I feel like the Reverb YouTube channel, shouldn't they be being paid by the people that they're making the videos about the products? But basically running more ads is what they're saying to get more people onto their site to buy your stuff. Now this is a big one to me, increase the capacity of global customer support. I think Reverb really needs to go after Japan because that is a booming market. And at this point in time, it's really about the Yahoo Japan auctions and a few other sites that do kind of a similar thing that compile listings together. But I don't really see that helping the bulk majority of people because they don't want to ship internationally. They want to ship within the country. A lot of people fear international shipping. And for good reasons, you know, customs can be kind of scary sometimes. And then they're saying that they're going to be enhancing seller tools and services. I'm kind of at the point where the layout's not broken. I don't think they really need to fix much. 
but I know they are a B testing a few things like, like now certain select sellers can actually send an offer to people who are watching the listing. That's something they've been doing on Etsy and a few other sites for a while. So we'll eventually see that if it does well in the beta tests. But yeah, that pretty much sums up this email. So get your stuff listed and sell it before they increase their prices, I guess. <laughs> After I recorded this segment, I got another email that had some frequently asked questions. So uh, it looks like professional sellers and individuals is the same fee. I think that would have been nice if professional sellers could have kept the same old fee though. Kind of a nice discount or at least do like a paid service. That would be interesting. Looks like international markets. It's pretty much just all around there. Nothing else is really changing. I feel like number three is not worded very properly because number eight, this really stings. The maximum fee used to be 350 like we were talking. Now it's up to 500. I think that's just being greedy. Because as a seller that actually sells guitars that sometimes hits that maximum fee, Reverb really does not offer much protection in that situation because they won't process the payment because it's too much for their system. So you have to do a bank wire. And since the payment did not go through Reverb, they're not actually going to support that sale. So they're just taking your money and not actually giving the buyer or seller anything from it. Looks like people were questioning new and used gear. I think that would actually be interesting to have brand new guitars be taxed higher and or lower because then maybe people would stop listing used guitars as brand new. <laughs> but I guess then you would also get dealers abusing that and listing brand new guitars as used condition. And yeah, I could see how that would cause some issues. And it looks like everything after this point will get that fee. Your old listings won't be grandfathered in, so you'll have to adjust your prices accordingly. So this really kind of stinks here because not only were we hit with sales tax this year because of how laws changed. So a lot of people are, you know, getting off of reverb simply because of that. I mean, it's also on eBay. It's not just reverb. But now that they're increasing their rates, I think we're going to see a lot more people go back to forums. And this does pave the way for somebody else to create the new, new reverb. <laughs> but at the end of the day, all they really did was match Etsy's fee structure. I just hope they don't start charging listing fees and advertising fees like Etsy also does. I feel the guitar market is competitive enough that they won't. As for me, I'll still be using Reverb. So let me know your thoughts down in the comment section about this new price increase. I think we all knew it was coming though because Etsy is not a private little company. They've got stock, they've got shareholders that they need to respond to. So I'm sure some of this is just to put more money in their pockets as well. But anyways, enough drama today. Let's go ahead and do some reverb hunting for guitars. And I apologize in advance for the bad audio in this episode. I had recorded it. You can see it right here. I clicked record and you can see it right here at the end where I click not record. For whatever reason, Final Cut just did not save this voiceover work. And since these are live reactions and stories, you can't really re-record this stuff. <laughs> so what do we got today? Last night I saw a lot of cool stuff that I didn't quite get the chance to check out. So I know we've we at least got some cool stuff going on towards the end. <gasps> okay, these things right here. I've been seeing them show up lately and I've been looking for one of these because it's so crazy. Nobody's ever talked about these. This is a burst driver. Now, if you're thinking what on earth is a burst driver, it was one of those crazy hair-brained Henry Jeskowitz era type things where they put a distortion pedal inside of your Les Paul. That's just so crazy to me. I really want to review and demo one of these because why wouldn't you want a distortion pedal in your Les Paul? They must not have sold that well and they like held them back at Gibson and they're just recently shipping them out because I've been seeing these things show up. So I mean, maybe if I can find one cheap enough, we'll do a full review and demo. I'm not paying 57 for it. Oh, dang, that's dirt cheap. It has to have a headstock repair. That's all I got to say. 1200 bucks firm. They're saying it's a standard, but it kind of looks like a classic due to the uh, pickups that they have in here. Okay, looks like they had some sort of other pickup in here that used a three-prong system. Pretty worn, but it looks all right. Um, potentially refretted, kind of hard to tell in that photo. Definitely had some sort of a headstock repair, maybe even two. But it seems to be repaired okay, I would say. Somebody tried to do some refinishing. Oh, wow, that's a big ding. I don't know, what is it, a uh, 1998? 1988, really? No, all things considered, I think that's actually a pretty fair price. Uh, 1988 Les Paul Standard in like original condition, not broken and stuff. You'd be between like uh, low 2000s to low threes. 
So 1200 bucks, it's probably going to be gone by the time you see this video, but you can check it out. I'll leave a link in the description. That's a decent deal on a TP6 tailpiece if you need one of those. Moving on to page two. Wow, that's not a bad deal on that custom. It's just deal central today. I used to buy a lot of white customs from Japan because you can get them at decent prices. 92, so early 90s era, those are good guitars. Looks like 498T in the bridge. 57 classic plus, so somebody must have swapped some pickups around, but that doesn't matter, they're all Gibson. Oh, and if you wanna know why the shipping is so expensive, it's because it's hard to get things out of Japan right now because, because EMS, the cheapest service, isn't offering flights to the USA right now. But honestly, even at 2650, that's a good deal for someone. But feel free to swoop in and just take it because I'm not that worried about it. I don't really like buying guitars just to sell them anymore, unless I wanna review them or something. This page, um, that's a Les Paul Studio with a natural top. To, somebody had to have stripped the finish off of that. Because usually the natural studios, they get like really nice tops. Well, maybe not. Okay, yes. <laughs> that's funny. From this photo, I thought that was a maple neck. So I was kind of intrigued, right? But then you get closer and you realize, oh, that's the original white finish. Who does that? Takes a white finish off of... I think this, is this a golden era studio? What year is it, 90s? <laughs> okay. You know, it, it's one thing if you wanna block off the serial number, but block off the last three. People need the first five because it tells them the day it was made as well as the year it was made. Especially since it's not even advertised as what year it is. And it just says early 90s. Because that does matter for some buyers. They're buying it because it's their birth year guitar and they're looking for that birth year birthday. So that's why you should always at least give the first five digits. Moving on, one of those Midtown Kalamazoo's. Cool guitar, not my favorite. And now we're getting into the ones that I saw last night. So that's a cool modification. That's a cool one. Let's go ahead and get a couple of them to look at because I know there's a lot of fun ones. And this was another one that was uh, tempting. I'm going to be doing a made to measure Gibson very soon. I've, I've been designing that with somebody who's pretty good with Photoshop. I might do an episode that kind of just goes through that process. There it is. That's what I was talking about. 74 Sparkle Top Deluxe. And if I remember correctly, there was like one or two more. Here's a cool one. Here's a cool one. You can definitely tell all the stuff's getting listed now. They want to sell it before the prices go up. Okay, so this one is based off of uh, Pete Townsend's uh, number three, I guess. Wow. I don't, th I don't think his quite looked like this. His was a little bit different. He's mainly known for the mini humbucker, mini humbucker, and then a humbucker in the middle. But that's a 75 Les Paul Deluxe. Looks like replaced tuners on that one. And uh, in interesting. I wonder what they had mounted over there because it looks like the route is just for a mini humbucker. But then they put a humbucker in the neck, kind of routed a little bit too closely. And then they've got this large bridge, 100 million little switches. You know, for somebody that just likes the quirky guitars, I love the different colors on the switch tips. It looks like it's been refretted, so you should be good to go up with playing it. But wow, that's a mess of wires. Ooh, that's a nice case. Those are actually worth quite a bit of money. People like those yellow interior ones. Oh well, heck, does it have any headstock repairs? No, but you can see it's got a little bit of wear right there. That's a really early maple neck too. That's surprising. So if you want something a little bit quirky, I think two grand, it, it's about fair. I mean, it's not overpriced. It's not underpriced. Oh, and here's one of those cool uh, trans purple flame top Les Paul classics. I don't remember the story on these guys, but those early classics, like, like pre-1993, they're basically the uh, Les Paul reissues of the day. And this is one of those uh, limited edition finishes where yeah, that's kind of cool. Kind of Barney purple at the same time. Reminds me of the limited colors editions Les Paul. If it's truly mint, that's not too bad of a price for a collector, but you know, still a little bit on the high side, mainly because of condition. I'm not even sure if the made to measure program will use vintage parts if I sent it to them, but that's something to keep in mind because I mean, if you're looking for this part, I mean, people will pay out the nose for it if they really need it. So 150 bucks, I mean, it might sound crazy to pay that for plastic, but it's not too bad. So that's an early 70s and that's a later 70s one. But what is the story on this Sparkle Top Deluxe? Blue Sparkle Top, still my favorite. I've done the review and demo, so I don't necessarily need another one unless it's like 100% mint condition and I wanna keep it myself. So judging based on the price, it should be very clean. It looks like it's aged a little bit, so it's not quite that crisp blue anymore. It's more of like a bluish green. 
But the big thing for these guys is always uh, break cracks and repairs. Ah, darn, there's a small touch up right here. So it's not a perfect example. So it definitely has some edge wear. I don't think it's necessarily that much better than the one that I documented, but it is available if you're a collector and you want it and they are open to offers. This is what I saw on a, a Facebook group. This is like a Neil Young modified double cut, but the story is this is like a real vintage Gibson Firebird pickup. Then they've got that metal plate there. I mean, this looks pretty cool. I mean, for being a relic job, it's got a Bigsby with a wrap tail if you don't want to use the Bigsby. So if you're a Neil Young fan, I could see you getting worked up over this. Having that vintage mini humbucker is kind of a cool attribute. I think this started life as a, a double cut studio. So those things normally sell between like 600 to 1,000 bucks. It's kind of pricey for what it is, but you got to remember that pickup is actually worth quite a bit. I'm not a huge fan of the relic job that was done though. So maybe 12 to 13 if you really have to have it. So not something that I'm interested in, but kind of a cool piece nonetheless. But oh my gosh, this, this Explorer, man, I wish it was cheaper. <laughs> that is a nice top. It kind of reminds me of a Carina Explorer from this angle. That's what I thought at first when I saw it there. But the CMTs, I don't think I've actually seen a natural one before. Usually they're kind of like a dark burst color, but that is a gorgeous top. And it looks like the original Dirty Fingers with the double row of gold pole pieces, original TP6 fine tuning tailpiece. The binding, you're either gonna love it or leave it, but it's just kind of one of those interesting 80s models. That is a nice top, I dig that. There's gonna be a collector that's very happy that I just showed him it. So I'll put a link to this one in the description too. This thing seems to be in pretty good shape. Three piece body, I mean, what can you really expect in this era? Three piece neck, maple, made in 1983, 234 day of the year. And it was the uh, 12th in production for the day. Dang, this thing is clean. Ooh, original uh, Lifton style case. Ah, darn it. There's a little bit of stand rash down here and a replace strap button. I'm not too worried about that. You would need to find the original correct diamond posi lock shape buttons though for it. That is definitely the crown jewel of his collection, but man, that green Stratocaster is really cool too. How much does he want? Four and a half? A little bit more than that. <laughs> do me a favor. Do not buy this guitar. As, as high priced as you think that might be, I think it will sell given enough time. I mean, that is a nice piece. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed hunting on reverb with me. I know it's been a while since we've done this type of video, but I like to tie this in when there's like reverb related news. So hopefully this doesn't bite reverb too much in the foot, but I'm sure people will be upset for about a month or two and then it'll just all blow over and we'll be okay. The biggest thing that I'm interested to see is if eBay also raises their price or if they're gonna play competitive here. So thank you troglodytes for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.